Palantir Technologies, is this the next tech supergiant or is it simply a stock market bust that's going to continue dropping in price? That is what I've spent the last six hours trying to figure out the answer to. I have poured over every single earnings call I can find, financial statements, investor relations, everything I can find. That way I can present to you the most clear picture of what Palantir does and what their potential is in the future and if this is a worthwhile investment. So we're gonna cover a summary of what Palantir does and how they started, because it's a bit confusing what they do. I had to dig quite a bit to really understand what they do. We know there's a lot with data. I'm gonna cover that. Then we're gonna get into whether this is a good investment or not and some interesting things I found in my discovery process. So starting off, Data, data, just period. Our data is everywhere. And Palantir has built itself around data to help cut costs at businesses, prevent tax evasion, predict terror attacks, and a, a whole lot more, all things data. Some of their bigger clients include the CIA, BP, Airbus, 3M, and, and many more that we're gonna discuss later. They build software allowing governments and businesses to analyze their own data and help those entities make better decisions. Whether that de decision is simply saving money on something in their supply chain or saving lives in some foreign country. Now, fun fact, the company's name came from the Lord of the Rings where the magical Palantiri were seeing stones described as these indestructible balls of crystal used for communication and to see events in other parts of the world. So it's a, it's a pretty good name. The second fun fact, you can also use the link in my description for Webull to get two completely free stocks. All you have to do is deposit $100, two free stocks in your account. You can jump in on the stock market. It's a pretty darn good deal. Plus, you'll be helping out the channel while you're at it. Moving on from here, in the summary, Palantir was founded in 2003 by a group of fellas. First one is Peter Thiel, who is the co-founder of PayPal, an early investor in Facebook, and he's done tons of other things. Next, we have Nathan Gettings. Then we have Joe Lonsdale, who's an early employee at Pay PayPal. He's a tech investor in many companies like Wish. Uh, Stephen Cohen, who's another co-founder, he's a data scientist who actually came up with Palantir's prototype in just eight weeks. And then finally, we have Alex Karp, who is a longtime friend of Peter Thiel's, who has two doctorate degrees and serves as the current CEO. Now, the concept for Palantir really started back in the PayPal days, where they were losing $10 million per month in fraud. Then they built some systems that combine automated suspicious data flagging with human reviewers to successfully combat their rampant fraud issue. And I assume starting Palantir, they were sitting around thinking something like, hey, we just saved ourselves $10 million a month. I bet other companies would be willing to do the same thing. Not a bad idea. After starting Palantir, though, they struggled to find additional investors other than Peter Thiel until a CIA venture capital business in QTEL gave them a shot and threw them $2 million to get things going. And that was just the beginning of deep governmental connections and deep governmental contracts that are proven to be pretty fruitful in present day. Eventually, Palantir started working with the CIA to help analyze data and identify terror attacks. My first thought is, as soon as I read this, that the US government is willing to spend boatloads on this. And it's also a good signal to other governments. If the US is trusting Palantir to do these things, Canada will probably see that and be like, well, oh, we, we trust them too. Great Britain, we trust them too. So I think it could be a stepping stone to other governments. But moving on here, their first co corporate customer was JP Morgan, where they helped that firm identify fraud. And to date, they have saved JP Morgan hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, my thought here is, as a business owner myself, <clears throat> if I signed up with a service that is saving me X amount of dollars per month, I would be willing to pay a percentage of those savings every single year to keep those savings going. Let's say, let's say I could save $100,000 a year with some new service. I'd probably be willing to pay $30,000 a year to save that $100,000 a year. And this is basically what they're doing. Now, there have been concerns with Palantir's practices. I mean, they are dealing with mountains of data, including data from innocent people, unknowing people. There's always concerns when it comes to personal information. They've also have certain complaints from their clients who don't agree with their terms of service and how opaque their agreements are. They've also been criticized for having too much leverage in the bidding process for government contracts. A few things just 
to parlay this into something interesting. A few things they've been credited for finding, though, include uncovering spyware on the Dalai Lama's computer, helping to find Osama bin Laden, and discovering Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. Now, these may or may not be true, but there are, there are rumors that are out there that they help with these things. It's argued that although Palantir has yet to earn a profit and their expenses are increasing every single year, there's some scary finances that we're going to cover in a little bit, that it's argued that Palantir is so important to organizations like the FBI, the CIA, the, the NSA, other three-letter organizations, that they simply can't fail because they're so pivotal to those organizations. However, I take that with a grain of salt because it's never safe to assume any investment has no risk. That's where you're going to get caught with your pants down. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I kind of get what they do, but not exactly. And you're not alone. I was in the exact same boat just a couple hours ago. So I found this presentation on one of Palantir's products. It's called Foundry that explains a scenario where Palantir can benefit a company. So let me pull over this presentation just so we can get a better understanding of what exactly they do through this this presentation. So let's take a listen here. Take a manufacturing plant as a first example. To create a 360 degree view of the plant, we are joining massive amounts of data, like sensor data from plant operations, or logistics data from distribution centers, or financial data from ERP systems to create the plant object. As we continue to integrate data to support more and more use cases, our ontology continues to grow. We also link the plant to key entities like distribution centers, customers, and raw materials, which are backed by even more data sources. The result of this data integration and mapping work is immediate transparency into the business objects, that plant, for business users across the organization. As a supply chain manager, a logistics officer, or a plant operations manager, I can see all the data that has been integrated to develop that plant object. And for any single plant, I can quickly see the most relevant KPIs to understand customers and distribution centers by city, as well as any demand alerts, and the demand in production over time. So in summary there for this scenario for a manufacturer, basically what they're saying they would do in that case is take all of their data points, whether that be input from employees, whether that be input from certain machines on a production line, input from inventories, and they put that all into one location. That way they can make smarter decisions. And something that was really interesting about this, about this presentation is it suggests decisions that you could make based on the data collected, and then whatever decision you make goes back into the data, making all of this data more and more valuable over time. Now, what this immediately made me think is, this is a situation where once someone becomes a customer, as long as they're using this service, they almost won't be able to ever not use Palantir because this is going to become so pivotal to their organization that they'll, they'll simply need it. Now, I wanted to skip ahead here uh, just to uh, highlight this point for a second. Discovers excess inventory of a particular raw material that will expire in a few months. They can flag this as an opportunity, notify a customer account manager, and from there identify potential sales opportunities for those finished goods. So in that scenario, their system spotted some inventory that was going to expire, sent a notification to a sales manager that said, hey, this is about to expire. Here's some potential people you could reach out to to sell this to make sure that ex about to expire inventory doesn't completely go to waste, thus saving the company more money or making the company more money, whatever you want to decide uh, to call it. So after I saw that, I was thinking, okay, this makes much more sense to me what exactly they do with data by actually seeing a scenario where you know they're doing something. Now let's cover some more recent news. We're going to go over to their recent press releases here. And we can see some of their new partnerships. We can see Palantir and 3M expand relationship to build dynamic supply chain. Palantir and Akin Gump collaborate on legal dig digital service platform. Palantir and BP deepen their partnership. And these are all very recent. Palantir Technologies and Rio Tinto sign multi-year enterprise partnership. I mean, and this just goes on and on and on with, with new contracts and new partnerships. Army Vantage reaffirms Palantir partnership with $114 million agreement. The partnerships with the government especially are getting deeper and deeper every single year. Now let's cover their Q4 business update. Now this thing is 54 pages long, but luckily for you, 
I read through the whole thing so you don't have to. And if that doesn't deserve a like and a subscribe on this video, I don't know what does. So we're gonna hop through this to see the most interesting points, starting with page 10. So we can see some, uh, some financial information that I thought was good to highlight. Our business grew significantly in 2020. We saw They saw a 47% revenue growth, 17% adjusted operating margin, and 21 deals signed in Q4 worth 5 million or more. 12 of those were worth 10 million or more. So these are all huge contracts that they're signing. And it gets even more exciting than that. We skip ahead a bit here to page 16. We can see their commercial business. In, in 2020, they generated 107% revenue growth from their commercial customers, which, are, which equates to 44% of their total revenue, which is increasing. And, and that, I, I like that that's increasing because um, one of the points here against Palantir is how heavy they are on the US government. Now, moving forward to page 31. This is an increase in their annual revenue growth. So we can see revenue from their top 20 customers is increasing. So 495 million up to 633 million from their top 20 customers. Now this is really interesting to me because it means customers are spending more every year on Palantir, which means that their service is valuable. That's a very good sign in my opinion. Now we move on from here to pay, oh, page 32. This covers new customers. New customers acquired in 2020 generated $42 million in revenue and the average revenue per customer increased by 41%. Now we're gonna go over to page 34 here. And they're saying this is only the beginning of their customers includes eight of the Fortune 100, 12 of the Global 100, and 24 of the Global 300. So we're talking massive companies here, and they actually have programs that are coming out for more medium and small size businesses as well, which, which we're gonna uh, discuss briefly uh, later on. Now going to page 48, we can see long-term orientation, five-year outlook. They're looking for revenue of four billion or more in 2025. And then we're gonna end off here with the last page 49. Again, outlook, full year, this is their projections for 2021, revenue growth of in excess of 30%, and Q1 revenue growth of 41% more than last year. Now, that's all we really need to see with that investor presentation. Then from here, I wanted to cover their most recent earning call. And this thing is, I believe, 26 pages long. But again, lucky for you, you don't have to read it. So uh, starting off here, uh, we have some opening remarks. I wrote a summary for each of the, the opening remarks that gives you the basic gist. So that first one was the CEO, uh, and he basically said, we live in an increasingly data-driven world. Those who can best analyze the data, make better decisions, and avoid abuse of that data will come out ahead. Then we have some info from the COO, and he basically said, let me scroll down to the summary here. He basically said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And he talked about several big partnerships and how governmental spending is increasing. We kind of just briefly talked about that, so we're not gonna cover it again. Now, this is something I thought was interesting. Let me read it. We are committing to keeping a growth threshold of above 30% for the next five years, but not focused on the day-to-day quarter to quarter, near-term focus that quite frankly destroys business is one of the main reasons why so many of our businesses, especially in tech, are actually only serving Wall Street and not serving their clients and not serving every day. Now, I thought this was interesting because everything I'm reading about this just screams this is not a short-term investment. It might have short-term swings, but this is not the kind of thing where you're gonna see it pay off in six months or a year. Now, moving on from here, we have some questions from analysts and there were some good ones I wanted to cover briefly. Can Palantir sustain such compound growth barring any unforeseen negative economic impacts or should investors expect choppy yearly growth numbers? So he basically said growth was 47% in 2020, which is pretty crazy, and that we're confident in our long-term growth of being greater than 4 billion in 2025. So they're confident of that growth, basically in more words. The next question I thought was interesting, will big company deals such as the IBM announcement become more common as foundries price becomes more apparent to the public? Also, is there any time frame or chance for widely available bullet tech technical medium-sized businesses or consumer level software? 
So he said, in short, yes. We're automating the delivery of foundries. This means you can have full end-to-end -end use cases with no code, just drag and drop. And the end result is that we can deliver full power of our products to small, medium, and of course, large institutions. Now, it's kind of like Tesla, where they started with the very expensive car, and then they work down to more, more cheap vehicles. In this case, the vehicle is software that analyzes data. Now from here, in terms of profitability, when does Palantir expect to achieve a level where it can repeatedly and continually achieve profitability? They didn't really answer that. And there are some concerns with their gross margin, and, uh, but it's increasing. They're basically saying the gross margins are getting better. And that was it for the earnings call that I wanted to highlight. Now let's go into their financials. There were some things I wanted to point out here. Taking a look at their financials, we can see a market cap of $42 billion, shares outstanding $1.75 billion revenue per employee 448,000 which actually isn't too bad we go into their financials we only have three years of financials which isn't ideal um, but their financials have increased at a steady clip every single year we can see 2018 and 19 24 percent and then a 47 percent increase with a goal of at least 30 percent for the next four years we can also see that their gross income has increased steadily in the last three years, which is good. Their SGA expense, their selling general administrative expense, we like to see that as flat as possible. We've seen a big bump up in 2020. However, we also saw sales increase dramatically. So I feel this is likely just having to do with attempting to get more and more clients. So this isn't a huge concern in my opinion. Now, we don't have net income and net income is not great. It's very negative. They, they lost more than what they earned in total revenue, which is of course a big concern. And also going over to their balance sheet, looking at their liabilities, they have only added liabilities since 2018, which adds the concern of not only are they not profitable, but it makes it even harder to become profitable and just could mean a longer road to profitability. Now with companies that simply don't have profit, it's, it's harder to value by looking at financials. You know, you can look a lot at sales and you know, some of their debt, but at the end of the day, you're really betting on growth more than anything than earnings per share at the moment. Now there are reasons not to invest in this company. So let's cover all those reasons not to invest. The first one, the price to sales ratio is high. Even after their recent drop in price, we're still looking at a price to sales of just over 40. The industry average is 8.77. So we're, we're multiples over the industry average. However, the industry average ranges dramatically depending on the company. The equivalent price per share of the industry average, if Palantir was valued at the industry average, we'd be looking at a price per share of $5.26, which is pretty laughable for any long-term investor here, but that's the average in the industry. Just for some comparison here, Shopify's price to sale ratio is 97.54, Squares is 24.06, and Intuit is 13.47. Now those aren't direct competitors, but they are general tech companies doing somewhat similar things. There, there isn't many exact competitors to Palantir, so it's tough to compare. Now, another reason not to invest in Palantir is it has a large focus on the US government, a big portion of their clients are the US government. Now, we can say that that is a stable client, but there's always a risk if you have few large clients making up most of your revenue. Also, the company is not profitable. And like I said earlier, they have only taken on additional debt. Also, the way the corporate governance structure is set up, the founders will retain a large portion of control even if they own a few shares. And this is concerning to many investors, primarily more concerning to huge institutional investors. Then we have the issue of operating margin. It is negative, very negative. Operating margin is how much profit a company makes on a dollar of sales after paying for the cost of production. Now, in order for Palantir to be profitable, we're gonna have to see a dramatic change in their operating margin. In my opinion, a perfect price for Palantir, a price that would be a no-brainer to buy in absolutely right now, a value price, would be $13.95. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I think there's such a strong trajectory right now, we're not going to see a price anywhere near $13.95. If, if sales increase 30% as expected in 2021 to $1.417 billion in 2021, we're likely going to see a price of at least $33 per share. 
Now, if sales hit their goal of $5 billion by 2025, we're likely gonna see a price of at least $100 per share by 2025. However, if we see that level of trajectory, it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect much more. I believe there's a one to two year downside potential here of 30 to 40%. So if you were to purchase right now, there is an absolute chance of a 30 to 40% haircut right now. Not much more than that. But there's also a realistic upside of 30 to 65%. So in summary, I believe that this is an absolutely fascinating company with a ton of upside potential, increasing revenues at a very steady clip, increasing customers, and per customer growth that is extremely attractive and tells me that they're doing a good job and customers want more and more of their help. There are inherent risks though, especially in the short run. In my opinion, this investment will take cojones to hold as long as needed to see the fruit of this, of this investment, to, to really pay off. This is not a value play, at least not at current prices. However, I'm not sure we're gonna see the price go much lower either. So I believe this is a solid investment, especially for the long term. If we're talking a five to seven year investment, you will very likely see a strong payoff here. I went into this with no intention of purchasing whatsoever. However, now after doing all of this diligence, I plan to buy in and ride the ride and hold this thing long term. So that's gonna do it for today. I would like to thank you for watching and I hope you have a profitable day.